Welcome to Tales from SYL Ranch, where everyone is entitled to my opinion, and I'm Bill Stone. While I have your attention, I'd like to ask that if you like what I'm doing, please like this video, subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, share me on social media, and tell all of your friends, family, neighbors, pets, and livestock to do the same. Following and sharing my videos is really important. I'm a one-man shop with absolutely no money for advertising, and so social media is the way that I grow. So please follow me on Twitter at SYLTales and at the other social media. I'm signed up to every social media known to man. I would certainly appreciate your support via my PayPal tip jar, my subscribe star, my merch store on Teespring, or a place on my website where you can support me further. And there are links to all of these in my description box. Well, since you have come looking to this video for a review, I would have to assume that you have already watched Batwoman Season 1, Episode 10, How Queer Everything Is Today. But nevertheless, for safety's sake, I'm going to issue myself a... Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. All hands, prepare for incoming spoilers. Yes, it is a spoiler alert, and that is because I am a fan die master, and that means that the fandom is strong with me, and that means that nothing is new, nothing is original, and at worst I figure it out about a half an hour too early. This is neither a boast nor a brag, this is sadly where you find yourself after having watched, read, and listened to over a hundred years worth of science fiction. You just can't see the new stuff for the entire century that came before, and you find out there's very much, very little that's new in the world, and it sometimes interferes with your ability to enjoy things. So, the short review for this episode is really quite simple. It was stupid. Now, I haven't watched a lot of the Arrowverse since for some time. I caught Crisis on Infinite Earths, and for my thoughts on that, you can look back to my post-watch live stream on the subject from last week, and there's a link to that in my description box below. Suffice to say that Arrow lost me fairly early on, and I stopped watching The Flash and Supergirl when I could no longer stand the stupid soap opera relationships. The Flash and Supergirl and Batman um, suffer from what I call the Charmed effect. Now, this is something I first noticed in the early 2000s version of the Charmed TV series, a show, by the way, that I watched purely for the scantily clad hot chicks. They would be in the middle of some kind of action that would be kind of nice, and then all of a sudden they would pull the brakes and bring the elevated train, see what I did there, the L, bring the elevated train to a complete halt to do some stupid soap opera relationship work. But with Batwoman, someone told The Flash and Supergirl, hold my beer. Batwoman goes far beyond just pulling the brakes for soap opera. It's downright stupid in every way, filled with nothing but complete idiocy. Now, I usually like to start off a review by saying something nice about the show. You know, what are the good moments? In this case, I found that very damn difficult. Really, the only good moment was the Slam Bradley Easter egg. You see, Slam Bradley was originally conceived by Malcolm Wheeler Nicholson and developed by Superman creators Jerry Siegel and Jerome Schuster, Joe Schuster. He first appeared in Detective Comics number one in March of 1937. He predated Superman's first appearance in Action Comics number one in June of 1938 and Batman's first appearance in Detective Comics, the same book where he was, in number 27 in May of 1939. Slam Bradley was outlined by Wheeler Nicholson in a May 13, 1936 letter to Jerry Siegel, who had previously created, uh, with Joe Schuster, DC's character Dr. Occult, still around today, believe it or not. That letter stated, and I quote, We need some more work from you. We are getting at least two magazines in July, and possibly two, the first one, is definitely in the works. It will contain longer and stories and fewer. From you and Schuster, we need 16 pages monthly. We want detective, a detective who uh, we call Slam Bradley. He has to be an amateur called in by the police to help unravel difficult cases. He should combine both brains and brawn, be able to think quickly and uh, reason cleverly, and as well as be able to slam bang his way out of a barroom brawl or mob attack. Take every opportunity to show him in a torn shirt with swelling biceps and a powerful torso a la Flash Gordon. 
The pages should be the same size as in New Comics. That was a comic book, by the way. The name was New Comics. But to contain eight panels in a page instead of six. And that was what he had to say about that. There wasn't really much to Slam Bradley. Originally, he had not operated out of Cleveland, Cleveland, which, by the way, was where Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster lived, and then later in New York City and even later in Metropolis. Slam and his sidekick, Shorty Morgan, had uh, numerous fight-filled adventures, often going undercover in various professions to catch their man. Though most stories had a mystery uh, uh, quality to them, Slam was more likely to uh, solve them with his fists rather than his brains. Now, amazingly, a modern version of this character was revived in 2001 when uh, writer Ed Brubaker and artist Darwin Cook revived the character in the four-part serial serial called um, the, uh, sorry, I'm reading it here, The Trial of Catwoman in Detective Comics number 759 through 762. And in this story, he investigates the death of Selina Kyle and in the process runs afoul of the Batman. Now, this incarnation of the character was a former police officer in his late 50s uh, who worked at Gotham City. Bradley then became a supporting cast member in the Catwoman series of the early 2000s. So, in terms of good moments, that's it. That's all. Fini. There are no other good moments. It was entirely stupid. I mean stupid. From beginning to end. All right. So, the stupid moments. Now, ordinarily, I might talk about the cringe moments. But in this show, the cringe moments are just plain stupid. My only choice is to walk through the entire episode. So, start off with, there's a uh, elevated train that has lost its brakes and is speeding towards certain doom. Now, I had mentioned here that Batwoman starts driving along the tracks, in the center of the tracks with her motorcycle, and apparently the shocks on this cycle are so good that the wooden cross beams that run underneath the tracks did not cause the bike to jump, bounce up and down uncontrollably and throw her off of it. Uh, <laughs> didn't bounce in the slightest. Batwoman then stops the L train with a batarang and a length of cable of less diameter than my index finger. Furthermore, she brings the plane to a train to a complete stop, an instant stop from 90 miles an hour to zero in less than a second. The passengers should have been splattered the same as if they'd hit a brick wall. Th this should have been a spectacular train wreck. Which, of course, this whole show is just a spectacular, spectacular train wreck. And then the cable snaps. Not while the train's being slowed down, mind you, but after it's stopped. And the end of the cable is about to whip through Batwoman and kill her, although, you know, why it would kill her when uh, stopping the train from nothing had no effect on the passengers, I will never know. When Detective Slam Bradley of the GCPD pushes Batman down and out of the way, the people then standing on the station see uh, this and start taking pics, and all of a sudden everybody starts shipping. And yes, they actually use the term shipping in the episode. They start shipping Batwoman and Slam simply because he pitched her down and was briefly on top of her. Furthermore, Batwoman has absolutely no problem with all of these people taking pics of her. Though, to be honest, we'll see more of this and far worse of it later on in the episode. And all of this stupid happens in the first two minutes, 33 seconds. And yes, I timed. It only gets worse. Yes, it gets worse. Really. For the next 40 minutes, it actually gets worse. This show is just that stupid. And by the way, let's just, you know, explain why I'm doing this review in the first place. Why would I review this crap fest? It's not usually the sort of thing that I review. Well, it's because people who review this show tend to get views, and I'm not above doing the same. I would honestly prefer to watch the entire two hours of Frankenstein 1970 over this crap, but... I'm doing it for the views. Next, we get to the voice of disgraced journalist Rachel Maddow. She voices a radio talk show on the show, Is in the context of this show. She's hosting a radio talk show. Thank God we never see her. We only hear her. But every time she speaks, it's like fingernails on a blackboard. So I get it. I get it. Batwoman's gay. Maddow is gay. Ooh, how edgy. Oh, by the way, I saw what you did with the episode titled, by the way, How Queer Things Are Today. Hey, way to go. How clever. 
Then, for reasons that I cannot possibly fathom, Kate is upset that Gothamites think that Batwoman is straight. Who cares? <laughs> is, is she planning to go on dates dressed as Batwoman? If I were a masked vigilante, I wouldn't care in the slightest what people thought about my sexuality. If you care what people think, you wouldn't dress up as a giant bat and go fight crime in the first place. You know what? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I cannot take this anymore. This is within the first five minutes. The entire plot is stupid piled upon stupid piled upon stupid. If you're watching this review, you probably watched the episode. And if you don't know how stupid everything in it was, then you are some kind of low-grade moron or SJW NPC. I've never seen anything this stupid. I guess maybe Frankenstein... No, no, Frankenstein 1970 is better. By the way, the film was shot, I think, in 1958. It's a terrible, terrible movie. Worst one I've ever had reviewed. And I, I review classic films quite frequently on this show. I've got, I've got, I think, four or six scheduled for February. So, you know, watch for those. I do classic films. And by classic, I just mean anything made between about 1900 and 1980. And so I've got a few scheduled. Next month, I have them peppered throughout the entire year. So watch for those. They're usually a lot of fun. Sometimes I make live streams out of them. But... Uh, yeah, Frankenstein 1970 makes more sense than this stupid, stupid show. So we can get into the mechanics of making a film because that's part of what I'm pretty good at. It's one of the ways that I distinguish myself from other reviewers. The writing. Now, I always mention the writer right off the bat, so to speak. <laughs> and that's because every time, everything that you see begins with the writer. If you don't have a script, then you have nothing to shoot. So from a dramatic, and in this case, intelligence or lack thereof perspective, it is the fault always of the writer. And in this case, the responsibility for this piece of junk is one Caroline Dries. She is the uh, creator uh, and producer on this show, Batwoman, and she has so far written four episodes. She executive produced The Vampire Diaries, produced Melrose Place. Um, amazingly, she was story editor for 41 episodes of Smallville and wrote 10 of them. I'm guessing it was the 10 stupid episodes. She has never won any awards. She's never even been nominated. What a surprise. Oh, and she's gay. Anybody really shocked about that considering this show? Thus, I'm brought back to something that I mentioned in my review of Doctor Who season 12, episode 4, Tesla's Nikola Tesla's Night of Terror, which dropped just a few hours ago. Doctor Who, Season 12, Episode 4, Nikola's, Nikola Tesla's Night of Terror. In my Fandai Masters review, you can see I've got a link to that below. Go and watch it. Now, I thought I was being clever by mentioning it in that episode, but great goo, I never imagined how apropos it would be only about six or eight hours later. Once again... I'm going to steal something from someone that I had a Facebook conversation on when we were discussing the lack of character development in Doctor Who. However, it absolutely and very much more specifically applies to Batwoman. Here's what he said. I'm convinced that there's an ideological reason for why feminist characters don't get proper character development. It comes from the neo-Marxist victim uh, narrative mentality where all you need to have worth as a person is to check off the appropriate uh, boxes to have a sufficient score of victim points in the oppression Olympics. What you uh, actually do doesn't matter. All that matters is how much of your existence feeds into the god of victimhood. They want to reinforce the notion that uh, being a victim is how much of your existence feeds this victim god. They want to reinforce the notion that this feeding of the victim god is all that you need to actually want their characters to not... And so, and so they don't want their characters to actually get any development. The idea is that they manipulate you into accepting that these are good characters based solely on how many victim points they have, thus getting you to buy into the overall political narrative of victimhood. Since that's not their goal, is not telling a good story, the less character development they get is a good thing. All they need is to establish that the character is a victim and has credentials. 
and that's all they want. So if they start telling actual stories with the characters, then you might start liking them for reasons other than identitarian politics, and from their point of view, that's bad. Now, what I don't get is how anyone with any basic degree of humanity left in them at all could see this uh, happening and not recognize it for the evil beyond all reason that it is. At least with you know something completely horrible like real life torture porn or snuff films, the perpetrators are trying to get something understandable out of it, sexual gratification for someone. Genocide is typically committed with at least the uh, theoretical goal of security. The uh, way that evil normally works is that there is a good end with a really bad means. But this is something else. Even their short-term end goals are bad. But the bad short-term end goals aren't the real reason why SJWs are the worst. The real reason is that they have no long-term goals to justify the short-term ones. For contrast, let's look at some of the examples of total evil from the past. If the Nazis succeeded in killing every last Jew, you'd think the Nazis would at least be happy about their success. If the communists succeeded in overthrowing capitalism completely and burning Wall Street to the ground and, seating, seating, uh, 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 and, and seeing that last king strangled with the entrails of the last peace priest having ushered in the classless utopian society they preached about, then you'd think that they'd at least be happy about their success. But these neo-Marxist types have no goals. They are, there are no conditions under which they'd say they were successful. They are flat out never happy under any circumstances ever. And that is the reason that SJWs are the worst. Not just because they have evil means, not just because they have evil short-term goals, but because they have no long-term goals. Their fight literally has no victory conditions. As long as there are two sneeches left on the beach, they will be organizing a rights movement against one of them against the other until every last one is dead. And that's an end quote. That's with this show. This show has no real character development. It is just endless throwing victimhood points into the right buckets. Even plain old common sense and the basic laws of physics have been sacrificed to the victim god. And you know what, Carolyn Trees? No matter how much of this you do, no matter how much you try, what complete crap you throw at us every single week, you will never be happy. And the tragedy is that you'll never be able to understand why. Other things we can talk about, acting. Ruby Rose is a block of wood, as always, done and done. No one else is worth mentioning, as they're all sacrificial lambs to the altar of the victim god, I'm sure they were trying, but how do you give a decent performance when everything that's being written for your character is galactically stupid? We could talk about the direction, the photography, cinematography, production design, ma music, costuming, makeup. Who cares? Really, who cares? It's, it's reasonably competent, but in a show that is so stupid that it sacrifices every detail to the victim god, you're too busy with your brain attempting to process what you're being told and what you're seeing it's supposed to make some kind of sense. We could talk about the special effects, but to be honest, this time around, there weren't very many of them. That's a good thing, because typically when we see special effects in this crap fest, they look like really terrible CGI. So, at the end of a review, we often ask ourselves, is it any good? Oh, by Grubthar's hammer, no. This show is, and consistently has been, the dumbest thing on TV. I wish, I wish that we're just outright camp, like the 1960s Batman TV show. At least then, the stupid was, you know, intentional, and you knew that you were supposed to laugh at it. This show is just an hour of complete stupidity. I, you know, while I really detest commercials, and I try not to watch, and I, I try to find ways to watch episodes so I don't have to see them, I was watching this live, and I found myself looking forward to them, commercials, because they were better than the show itself. They were smarter. They made more sense. It might be so good that it's bad. I'm really not too sure. You might try watching this trash with friends because then you might potentially start, you know, having a fun time. Being in something other than a legal state of mind would probably help too. 
Otherwise, no, God, I wouldn't bother watching. This show has been a train wreck since its first episode, but this, oh, God, you know, you think it can't get worse. Every time I watch an episode of this, I think, I it couldn't get worse. No, no, this is, hands down, the worst, stupidest episode that they've done so far. And that is all that I've got to say about that. I would love to keep the conversation going, so please leave your comments, questions, and nasty remarks, and I'll do my best to respond to you. So thanks for watching. That is all the time that we have today for this episode of the highly acclaimed, world-renowned Tales from S.Y.O. Ranch, where everyone is entitled to my opinion. And I'm Bill Stone. Ultimate power in this world has always been one simple thing, the control and manipulation of minds.